Okay, good morning. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome here uh, Johan Marx, the ambassador of South Africa. We appreciate that, that you accept, uh, accepted your, our invitation to come over to West Ham and to give a presentation on your country. It is interesting for me, first time that I met uh, the name of South Africa, it was 1967 around Christmas, when it was a big news that uh, Professor Barnard made the uh, first heart uh, transplantation. And uh, from that time, I follow up uh, the development of South Africa. South Africa is a fantastic country. Uh, in terms of size, it is 15 times of the size of Hungary. But the population is uh, five or six times of, of Hungary. South Africa has a, an enormous potential, and because of that, it is very interesting for us to, to uh, know this country and to explore it in the future, in future corporations, uh, how can we go ahead with the scientific and uh, student exchange programs and other things. So again, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, this, uh, for accepting uh, your, your invitation and for giving the presentation. First of all, I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Hortobadi to give the short CV of uh, His Excellency. Thank you very much. Your Excellency. Uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Johan Marx was born in Johannesburg in South Africa. As far as his academic qualifications are concerned, Mr. Ambassador holds Bachelor of Administration in Political Sciences, Economics, International and Public Relations. Uh, qualification obtained for non-degree purposes are a completed uh, UN peacekeeping course in Vienna, Austria. As far as his extremely rich uh, professional diplomatic career is concerned, uh, he started uh, joining the Department of Foreign Affairs as a cadet in 1970 and uh, fulfilled several roles, served as a United Nations Specialized Agency Desk, a second and third secretary in Buenos Aires, Argentina, vice consul and general consul in Lima, Peru, acting head of mission at the embassy in La Paz, Bolivia. He also served uh, uh, several functions in the Latin American world, Latin America desk, uh, concern, um, concerning the uh, French-speaking background, Mr. Ambassador uh, served as first secretary, uh, counselor, and deputy head of mission at the South African permanent mission to the United States, to the United Nations, Geneva, Switzerland, and also consul to French-speaking cantons in Switzerland. Between 1982 and 1985, he served as head of mission at Saint-Denis in uh, the island of Reunion in the Indian Ocean, and then in the Islamic Republic of Comoros, and uh, also de facto Maurit representatives to Mauritius. Uh, to conclude, uh, he also served as head of missions uh, in Marseille, France, as Minister Plenipotentiary and Head of Mission of the South African Embassy in Paris, France. Uh, Director of Equatorial Africa, Acting Head of uh, Equatorial Africa and Indian Ocean Islands, and also he had the great honor to be the French language interpreter to the late uh, now President Nelson Mandela. Between 1996 and 1999, he served as the Chief Director of Equatorial uh, Africa and Indian Ocean Islands, 1999 and 2004, Ambassador to Israel, 2004-2012, Chief Director of Middle East uh, Department of International Relations and Cooperation, and finally, in 2013, uh, he had been appointed uh, ambassador to Hungary and non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Croatia. With a great pleasure to have you among us, uh, we are uh, kindly inviting you to hold your presentation. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. 
Miller and your colleagues at the University of Bononia, dear students, um, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be invited here today to address you all. I always feel very embarrassed when my CV is read out uh, because you realize just how old I am. My daughter, who is a student in uh, industrial engineering at the moment at Pretoria University in South Africa, has often asked me, Dad, what was it like to have known Moses? So uh, it's not often uh, nice to hear this kind of comment. Um, I'm, the presentation I'm going to do to you today is about the importance for South Africa uh, and the Africa uh, continent as a whole of our relations and engagement with the European Union, of which your country, of course, is now a very important member. Uh, we think there are very many areas that we can closely cooperate and which will be to the mutual benefit of both Hungary, the European Union, South Africa and the rest of Africa. By way of introduction, I'd like to first of all speak about South Africa's African priorities. Located at the southern tip of the African continent, the Republic of South Africa's future is intrinsically linked to that of the continent as a whole. Following its democratic transformation in April 1994, South Africa emerged from its apartheid era isolation to play a leading role in Africa. Being the largest economy on the continent for the last 20 years, the country's business sector began to expand its operations throughout the continent and is now well established in most African countries with uh, considerable market expertise on the continent. While South Af at the same time, South Africa has negotiated peaceful or relatively peaceful transformation process and leadership of its first democratic president, struggle icon Mr. Nelson Mandela, provided moral authority in Africa. A huge influx of immigrants from elsewhere in Africa soon followed, some legal, some illegal, illegally, in search of a better life for themselves and their families. This led to the realization in South Africa that collective economic advancement on the continent was essential for the country's continued economic development. I can just mention that one year after our democratic transformation, it was estimated that some 200,000 Nigerians alone were living in Johannesburg already, just a slightly more than a year after the changes. In addition, South Africa had a moral debt to fellow African countries for their active support in its lengthy liberation struggle. Aside from being part of an existing customs union, which is one of the oldest, we told, uh, in the world, dating back to 1910, with some of its immediate neighbors, South Africa joined regional economic organization, SADC, which is the abbreviation for the Southern African Development Community, and which consists of 15 countries in Southern Africa and the Indian Ocean Islands. At the same time, it also became a member of the Organization for African Union, later transformed into the African Union. The importance which South Africa attached to the role of the African Union in advancing the interests of the continent was demonstrated by our commitment to the, to the organization. During the last elections for the position of uh, AU Commission Chairperson, South Africa put forward the candidacy of one of our leading politicians, the candidate, former Foreign Affairs Minister Mini Zuma, who has also been Minister of Health and uh, Minister of the Interior, was elected to that position. And in that capacity, she attended last year the Budapest Africa Forum that was organized by the Hungarian government here. As from 1994, the South African government realized that Africa's economic development required peace and stability on the continent. This was emphasized by the terrible Rwandan genocide, which occurred at the same time as South Africa's first democratic elections. I just want to add here, at the time of the genocide, uh, Rwanda was one of the countries for which I was responsible in the foreign ministry. And I had phone calls from our media at the time, what is South Africa doing about uh, the situation in Rwanda? And I said, we just had our first democratic elections, our uh, new cabinet has just been appointed. They're still trying to sort out their offices, their desks. Unfortunately, at this point in time, it's very hard for South Africa to concentrate on anything outside its own uh, transition. 
But of course, everybody in the country felt greatly uh, affected by what had happened in, in Rwanda. The government therefore committed uh, itself to participate to, in peacekeeping operations on the continent and the promotion of democracy. From the outset, it involved itself in assisting with the peaceful resolutions of the African conflict situations, such as in the DRC and Burundi. Uh, I don't know if many of you, you are all probably too young to recall this, but in 1997, uh, there was an uh, attempt to overthrow the government in Zaire. Uh, then President Mobutu was in power there. And uh, we had uh, Mr. Laurent Kabila leading a rebel uh, group out of eastern Congo. And uh, we then intervened uh, in discussions to bring the two sides together uh, to hold uh, talks to bring about a peaceful transition. Uh, we, in the end, had to meet on a South African warship off the coast of Congo Brazzaville uh, and President Mandela uh, spent uh, quite a few days there in engagement in talks with both uh, President uh, Mobutu and Mr. Kabila which uh, assisted in the transition to uh, a, a new regime in uh, what then became the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mr. Mandela was also personally involved in Burundi and many of other leading politicians for many years in trying to solve their ongoing uh, conflict situation. More recently, the South African government also played an active role in this regard in countries such as Madagascar and South Sudan. In fact, the current uh, Deputy President of the African National Congress, the ruling party in South Africa, has been appointed as uh, South Africa's chief negotiator uh, to assist uh, with uh, solving the current conflict in South Sudan. At the same time, our government has also uh, emphasized the importance of advancing democracy in Africa by sending observers to monitor elections on the continent in all cases where we were invited to do so. Against that background of the importance of uh, Africa for South Africa, I'd like to now focus more closely on Africa and Europe. Geographically, uh, it has been determined that Africa and Europe were destined to have a symbiotic relationship. Adjoining the Eurasian landmass mass in Egypt with close proximity at the other end uh, of the North Africa at the Straits of Gibraltar, the African continent is crucial to Europe's future. Stretching southwards for some 8,000 kilometers and with a 30 million kilometer landmass, Africa has for many centuries played a key role in European affairs. There's just the maps that you can have an idea of how the, the 54 states look and how close Europe is on the west side and how it adjoins the raising land mass there between Egypt and uh, uh, the Middle East. From Roman times to the Muslim invasion of Spain and recent political upheavals in Africa, the continent has had a major impact on Europe. In addition, in recent years, we have witnessed a new African invasion of Europe namely of desperate economic migrants wanting a better life. It is thus evident that in determining their own future within the European Union, European countries need to take into account their southern neighbours. In the 19th century, the relationship between the two continents was essentially a colonial one, with Africa mainly ruled by European powers. This changed in the mid-20th century following World War II, with the successful political and or military struggle for independence by African countries. The emergence of 54 independent African states with equal voting power with all other countries in the United Nations General Assembly also had a major global impact. If we look at economic ties between Africa and Europe, until the late 20th century, Economic ties between the two continents largely reflected the colonial or former colonial relationships. However, the establishment of the African Union in 2002 saw the emergence of African determination to change the situation. African states generally recognized that the development of the economies would, in, at the outset, remain largely driven by commodity, commodity exports but they increasingly wanted to assert their own control over their economic destinies 
and development inter alia through commercial beneficiation. This resulted in the African Union Heads of State adopting in the early 2000s an integrated development plan for Africa. The plan, called the New Partnership for Africa's Development, or NEPAD, envisaged continental economic integration through regional economic blocks or communities. These regional economic communities included ECOWAS in the West Africa, the Maghreb Union North, the uh, East African Economic uh, uh, Community in the east of the continent, the ECAS in the center, and SADC that I already mentioned uh, in Southern Africa. In trying to emulate European economic integration uh, through the EU, the African Union faced a major obstacle, lack of infrastructure. Infrastructure development, along with industrialization, was this identified as a key priority for Africa by its heads of state. Uh, what struck me, ladies and gentlemen, when I arrived in Hungary, are the magnificent motorways that you have here. And obviously now you can drive from Budapest to London uh, on a motorway all the way. Uh, and um, throughout the continent, especially in the central and western part of Europe, you have this excellent road network, railway network, and of course, uh, uh, excellent financial services that bridge the continent. We still have a long way to go in Africa in this regard. At the same time, African heads of state recognized that political stability was another key requirement for economic development. Uh, a African Union mechanisms were accordingly put in place to promote democ democracy and good governance, such as through peer review mechanism and non-recognition of coup d'etats. Just examples on this regard. Peer review involved country reports being submitted to the African Union on an annual basis and a voluntary basis by countries to show to what extent democracy has been advanced or maintained in their respective countries. In the case of coup d'etats, uh, the most recent case we have here is, uh, one of the most recent is Egypt, where the government of uh, Mr. President Morsi was overthrown uh, and the African Union refused to recognize the military government in Egypt and will continue to do so until such time as their uh, a new uh, dem democratically elected government has been put in place. And the same applies elsewhere in Africa. Um, also established were African peacekeeping forces, which have been sent to countries such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo recently, and in which South Africa has actively participated. As well as to countries such as Burundi and the Central African Republic, well, and Mali, you'll be aware of the situation there as well. While well, countries such as Madagascar, have, and I mentioned South Africa's involvement in this regard, have been actively assisted in ending political crises. If we look at uh, African economic progress, since the year 2000, Africa has demonstrated impressive sustained economic growth with an average growth rate of 5,6% in the five, six, six year period between 2002 to 2008. While this fell to only 2,2% in 2009 due to the then global economic crisis, the continent quickly recovered with an average growth rate of 4,5% in 2010. This figure grew to 5% in 2012, dropping slightly to 4,9% last year, inter alia due to the current global economic slowdown. However, a higher growth rate of 5 0.5% is forecast for this year, while some individual African countries have achieved much higher rates. For example, during the period 2008-2012, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, Libya, Ghana and Rwanda each managed growth rates in excess of 8%. In Sierra Leone's case, 15,2% in 2012, uh, which I think is ex uh, 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 really <coughs> impressive by any standards. It is accepted that the content for the continent as a whole, this remarkable performance is largely commodity driven in terms of commodity exports, but other factors are also important. These factors include strengthening domestic demand due to rising incomes and in urbanization, also increased public spending, especially in the infra sector, uh, infrastructure sector. Other key factors include bumper harvests in some regions, as well as increasing trade and investment ties 
with other emerging economies. However, many challenges remain, notably relating to economic diversification, job creation and social development, including education. Another challenge remains increasing uh, trade into African trade, which uh, such trade is not only accounting for some 11% of total African trade. Looking at the continent's external trade, China, the European Union and the United States take more than 60% of Africa's exports at present and provide over 50% of its imports. The following three graphs provide a demonstration of the situation. You look at this one, the increase in uh, trade between 2000-2009, the United States 122%, EU 126%, and India more than 506%. And here you look at uh, Africa's export structure by partner, and you will notice that the European Union remains the largest export destination for uh, products, uh, uh, so African products followed now by China, which is overtaking the United States there. And the same applies in the case of African imports from the European Union. This is just a graph showing the growth in Africa's trade between 1980 and 2012. So you'll see it's increased uh, phenomenally in this period. <coughs> if we look at Africa's principal exports, uh, oil accounts for 85% of exports, although the number of oil producing countries is relatively limited, mainly countries like Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, uh, Gabon and uh, Angola are oil exporting countries. Motor vehicles, uh, lots are exported from South Africa. We have an agreement with the United States, so in fact the African continent has, it's called the African Growth and Opportunity Act, whereby the United States agrees to duty-free imports from African countries that are recognized by the United States as true democracies. So the result is that in South Africa, where we have major production of cars such as Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Toyota, these cars are uh, assembled in South Africa, uh, largely produced there and then exported into India to the United States. Uh, textiles, you'll see there, iron, steel, fruit and nuts, um, and uh, these increased, they've got the percentages by which these increased in 2010 and 2013, uh, 2011 at least. Export, Africa's principal exports to the European Union are the following. Fuels and mineral products, I won't read it out, you can see it on the screen, manufactured good agricultural products, while the continent's main imports from the EU are machinery and transport equipment, fuels, agricultural products, chemicals, and non-electrical machinery. It's just a trade with the EU countries, as you'll see where it is. Uh, there was this dip at the time of the global economic crisis, but it's uh, recovering steadily and at the moment we have a, a trade balance in Africa's favour with the EU. If we look at Africa's economic future, against this background it is evident that the key issues for Africa's continued economic development are the following. <coughs> Infrastructure development, increased modern road and rail networks as I've said uh, in individual countries and between them. Also increased electrification, such as the, the, the Grand Inga hydroelectric project that's envisaged in the, in the DRC, uh, which when it does uh, materialize, is expected to generate the equivalent of new, 20 nuclear power stations. This is due to the fact that the water of the Congo River, which is the largest, or well after the Nile, the largest river in Africa, flows, at the moment all the water flows straight into the ocean, it's wasted. And um, at the mouth of the river, it's envisaged that this project will be uh, is constructed. Then also, we need more export diversification into area through commodity beneficiation and industrialization. To achieve these goals, what is required is obviously increased foreign direct investment with accompanying skills transfers. It is especially in the latter area where Hungary, as an EU member, can play a key role, as I've already mentioned to the Rector in our uh, conversations. <coughs> Given Hungary's internationally acknowledged academic and scientific excellence, Hungarian investment in African education is seen by us as very important. If the prevailing economic situation in Hungary does not allow for large-scale investment in Africa, 
skills transfers can be done otherwise. For example, joint ventures between Hungarian and African companies or with other European Union companies involved in Africa. In a wider context, Hungary's current granting of scholarships to many African countries is directly assisting the continent's development. <coughs> Benefits for Hungary and Africa? The scholarship program is creating a lot of goodwill for Hungary and Africa and with important future benefits. Providing African scholarships help develop the continent's leadership of the future, which will create lasting friendships for Hungary. The rector mentioned to me this morning that there were students uh, from Vietnam in the 1970s, Professor, I think you mentioned, uh, who studied here in Hungarian at at uh, your University and which are today in leadership positions in Vietnam. And can this uh, really uh, increase ties between Hungary and, and Vietnam considerably? The same applies in Africa, in our view. Um, we have also already seen in the past this uh, result with Hungarian scholarships provided to South African exiles in the apartheid era, cementing Hungarian South African ties. In conclusion, I wish to state, ladies and gentlemen, that our continent, Africa, is rising and is therefore. It is therefore very much in the European Union and Hungarian interest to be actively involved in Africa's economic development. As happened in Asia, increasing standards of living in Africa will create enormous markets for the European Union, including Hungarian exports. This is assured, given Africa's current 1 billion population and US $3 trillion G gross domestic product. Conversely, Failure to accelerate Africa's economic development could have negative consequences for EU member states. As was seen at the outset, Africa's geographic proximity to Europe has already resulted in an increasing number of African migrants seeking a better life in Europe. Many of them crossing, as you know from TV or news programs, uh, and small little boats in the Mediterranean, many unfortunately dying on the way, uh, and then arriving on the European continent looking for jobs and a better life. It must thus be expected that these numbers would only increase the development gap between Africa uh, and the European Union, if the development gap between Africa and the European Union or, and Europe continues to increase. Thank you very much for your attention. Kusnam Sepen. <laughs>